Well, if you're new with us this evening, we are in a series we're calling the God Touch. And what I'm doing is I am basically marching down through some series from years ago that made this church a wealthy church. But you may not be able to see that in the message tonight. But it is intertwined with prosperity. Success, And, you know, I know I'm, I'm a smart guy. I know that the culture we're in is against success and prosperity, but who could be against success and prosperity? That's just crazy because you have to prosper, right? If you're going to even feed your children and put tennis shoes on their feet and buy them blue jeans, right? You got to prosper. And uh, I never came across somebody who was against success and prosperity who didn't want some of their neighbor's success and prosperity. <laughs> So the whole argument against success and prosperity, I think, is bogus to begin with. Well, if you have a Bible, why don't we, let me, I'm going to review a little bit, but let's pick up in Proverbs 13. And last time we were talking about how faithfulness is a key ingredient in having this God touch on your life. What do we mean, the God touch? That when you go to work, you don't go by yourself. You have the hand of God on your life, the blessing of the Lord on your life. I had a man tell me three or four months back that he had been kind of at the same place financially for years and uh, got into what we have been teaching at Faith Christian Center and changed jobs and got a 40% increase. And I said, well, brother, 40% works, you know, amen. And uh, so it's a matter of getting God with you on your life as you go. And it doesn't have to be work. I mean, you could be a student and you can have God with you. You can take God with you as uh, you go to school, go to college, whatever you're doing. Amen. 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 People would do better if they took God with them on a date. (laughs) You know, if you take God with you on a date, you're not going to have to decide whether to have the baby or whatever, right? In other words, whatever we do, it's better if we take God with us, right? So we've been talking about these steps to having the touch of God on our lives. And the number one was tithing. Number two is offerings. Number three is diligence in work. And I realize I'm counterculture. I admit it. Tell your neighbor, pastor's counterculture. And, uh, you know, I had a workman at my house today. And I, after the storms, I had two garage doors that weren't acting right. And so the guy fixes one, doesn't fix the other. And then I got a call, and then I got to wait for him to come back. He comes back. And then when I'm leaving to come to church, I find out, well, he messed up the codes in the two doors. Now, do you think I'm going to call him back the next time I need some service work done at the house? Oh, no, his, uh, his business card is going to hit the file 13. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so diligence and work. See, if we're, if we're good at what we do. So it's not just a matter of faith and confession and tithing. Now, let me tell you a secret about tithing. If you don't make any money, you don't have a tithe. Amen. So job number, we might say, well, job number one's tithing. Well, how about being a good employee? How about being good at what you do? Because if you're good at what you do, you're going to have a tithe. In fact, if you're good at what you do, you're going to have a bigger tithe, right, than if you were no good at what you do. So tithes, offerings, diligence, and work. The last one was faithfulness in marriage. And whenever I bring this up, people protest. The average millionaire in America has been married 38 years. And people protest, well, do I have to be married? It's not so much marriage per se as it is the character it takes to stay married 38 years. And uh, because we're talking about patience, oh, patience. And I'm not talking about me being patient with Pastor Sue, I'm talking about her being patient with me. It takes patience. It takes some uh, faithfulness. But there's another factor in that, and that is this. Every time people get divorced, money goes to lawyers, money gets divided. And then, unfortunately, a lot of times, divorce leads to custody battles. Well, now you have more lawyers. Now you have more money going out the door. So part of that secret of the average millionaire in America being 38 years is 
Money is not being wasted. Part of having money is not wasting money. The ultimate example, I think, is my father-in-law. Uh, it's 822 up there. He's sitting on his front porch or he's watching TV. But guess what he's not doing? He's not shopping. Once I teased him and I said, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing, Pop. He said, what do you mean? I said, you're doing the right thing. I said, don't spend any of it. Because I said, we will know exactly what to do with it. <laughs> he didn't know how to take that. But I mean, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Part of having money, because my father-in-law never really made, I don't think there was any year he ever made big money. But he just didn't go buy this and go buy that, and, you know, uh, overextend himself. And then he invested. In fact, one decision made him a multimillionaire. One decision, one decision, one decision. I don't remember the year, but in Cincinnati, they were building a new stadium. And back then, you know, they did those ashtray-looking stadiums for both baseball and football. And they were building a new stadium in Cincinnati. And that was during Jimmy Carter's uh, economy and interest rates. And he took everything he had at that point in time, and I believe they were 20-year bonds at 14 and three-quarter percent. He took everything he had. He had, to, he had taken every, his life, he had gathered up a quarter of a million dollars in savings, and he put a quarter of a million dollars, everything he had, in 20-year bonds at 14 and three-quarter percent. Go home and do the math. One decision made him a multimillionaire. One decision. But subsequent to that, if he had gone and bought everything that he thought he wanted, well, that would diminish what he has. All right, and then we left off last time, faithfulness for the sake of your children. And whenever I get to something like this, I have to watch myself because I have very deep feelings on this topic. And in 32 years of pastoring this church and 42 years since I started preaching the gospel, I would say that there is not any topic that I have been ignored on more than this right here. This is huge. And uh, we'll get into it and I'll try to govern myself. So we said last time, parents are to be a source of pride for their children, not a source of embarrassment. So your mission is not to embarrass your children. Number two, God's blessings for faithfulness go on way past your faithfulness. We dealt with this, that, that God would visit this punishment for sins to the third and fourth generation, but he would visit the blessing for faithfulness and obedience to a thousand generations. And so... I believe this. I, I, I'm just a believer in the Bible. I mean, I just believe it. So when I'm gone, God will be blessing my children because of my faithfulness. I believe it because I have the word on it. Picking up on new ground, number three, and this is where we actually left off last Wednesday. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Say it out loud. A good man, good man. leaves an inheritance for his children's children. And this is not a big deal. People always look at me sideways when I use terms like millionaire, it, it, it's no big deal. My, I had an uncle who was a, a great blessing to me when my father passed away. He was a few years younger than my mom. Um, he was probably my favorite uncle. And he never held a white collar job in his life. He worked probably almost the entirety of his adult life for Chrysler Corporation Never a white-collar job. But when, he, uh, when, when I got reacquainted with him, he was a help and a blessing after my dad passed away. He was a millionaire at that point already, simply by saving and investing. And I remember sitting at a pizza parlor one evening after my dad had passed away, and you know there were some, there were some days there. We had some, day, some time together. And I remember him telling me that guys that he worked with at Chrysler, they were always running to Vegas, and they were always getting uh, divorced, and then they were always into you know, uh, alcoholism and all this stuff and all the money being wasted. And he told me uh, he was Lutheran. But he wasn't just Lutheran because, you know, what does that mean? But he was Missouri Synod Lutheran, which is more conservative Lutheran, and he was a tither. And so he told me that uh, they didn't waste money, 
He tithed on everything he ever made, but he saved money. And he studied, he read, and he invested money. So here's a guy that never had a white-collar job, but saved money. And during a month of money a few years ago, I laid it out. It's just math. Tell your neighbor, it's just math. I laid it out that anybody in America can become a millionaire over a lifetime on $5 a day. Anybody. So the whole thing, the whole thing of, where you know, uh, I made bad decisions, so you ought to feel bad for me. I made bad decisions, so you should hand over part of your goods. It's all nonsense because anybody can save money, set money aside, and over time. But see, that's the problem. Because what what is coming out of my mouth right now is a very old-fashioned concept that has been rejected by our culture. And what is coming out of my mouth right now is the old-fashioned concept called deferred gratification. This is huge. Tell your neighbor, this is huge. huge. Now, let me just throw out a, a, a hand grenade here and give you another definition of deferred gratification. In our culture, our culture is completely oversexed. And so in our culture, children are taught in public schools, don't defer gratification, don't defer gratification, don't defer gratification, have sex now, male, female, have it, have it, have it. That's what they're taught. But think about all the people that had some sex early, then they caught a disease, or they had some sex early, they had children before marriage, they actually, over the course of their lifetime, have less sex than somebody who waited and got the right person, married, committed. I mean, we're talking about a lifetime of sex versus a few years early. What am I talking about? Deferred gratification. In other words, I might want some stuff today, but I don't go get it because I have a plan. Do you see where I'm I'm headed? In other words, and I'm not saying don't ever spend any money. I mean, I like to spend money. Uh, it's one of my shortcomings. I like to spend money. I like pizza, and I like Pastor Sue. So, so I mean, so I have to, I have to govern myself because nobody's going to govern me. I have to govern myself. And the way I do this myself personally, and I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, but I try. One of the ways I, I try and govern myself on this is I try. I'm not perfect at it, but I try that once I put money in savings, I don't ever pull it out. In other words, I have to find some other way. It's tough, and things come up. And, of course, I'm not talking about somebody being sick or or an emergency. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about all things being equal. And especially when it goes into some tax-deferred retirement account, because when you pull that out, you got to not only pay the tax, you got to pay the penalty. I did that one time to uh, finish a house that we bought at a discount that had been built, never moved into we bought it at a discount. I had to finish it. I did that one time. But after I paid the tax and then found out about the 15% penalty, I thought, I'm not ever doing this again. So this is one way we try and govern ourselves. A good man, Proverbs 13, leaves an inheritance for his children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. So Pastor Gene, what are you teaching? I'm teaching that a good man, Where did I get the phrase? Well, I got it right out of the Bible. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. See, our culture out here today is a culture of locusts. And I'm strong on this. Tell your neighbor, he's he's fixing to get strong. Your great, if Jesus tarries, your great, great, great grandchildren will pay interest on the profit money your government sent today to Planned Parenthood. Now think about what I'm saying. If Jesus tarries, your great-great-great-grandchildren will pay interest on the profit money our government sent today to Planned Parenthood. Now, here's an old-fashioned concept. Actually, if I'm not mistaken... You can go on YouTube. If I'm not mistaken, the very first time a president of the United States was ever recorded on video, I know it was Calvin Coolidge, but if I remember right, his talk was about taxation and spending, and every generation 
paying as it goes. In other words, rather than uh, uh, spend money and borrow the, f the future generations into oblivion, decide what's really important and pay as you go. In other words, we'd like to do this, but we can only do this. So since we can only do this, let's prioritize what we're going to do. Right now in this country, and you can look it up on the Forbes website, right now in this country, we spend 92, 92, 92% of all federal revenue on social programs, which basically means every nickel, when you see a jet fly overhead, Air Force, that's borrowed money. How do we pay the interest? We borrow it. Everybody here tonight probably has borrowed money to pay the minimum on Visa. Now, when you did that, did you not discover that was a futile endeavor? Did you not discover that? In other words, you owe the minimum payment, you don't have it, and you go get it off. In other words, I owe a minimum payment uh, to Visa of $200, I don't have it, so I go get $200 from MasterCard. And probably everybody in the room has done it. But I'm telling you, we've all figured it out, right? That is a hole to dig out of. But that's what they're doing. So we live in a generation of locusts. What do what, what locusts do? If you, have, if you don't know, just go online, do a search. Uh, when, when locusts come through, what do they do? If they go through cornfields or whatever they go through, they just decimate everything. They just eat everything. And that's the culture we live in. And it's not just here, it's all over the world. We, we send uh, billions and billions and billions all over the world to quote unquote help, but nothing ever gets fixed. And part of it is because when you, it, it's no different than you giving your drug dealer brother-in-law $1,000 for rent. Because if you give your drug dealer brother-in-law $1,000 for rent, odds are the money's not gonna go for rent. What's it gonna go for? or a, a drug user, not drug dealer. He's probably got the money. I'm talking about a drug user. <laughs> so you give a drug user $1,000 for rent, where's the money probably going to go? Drugs. So you are actually contributing to his delinquency. You're not helping. You're actually part of the problem. So a good man, where do I get this phrase? Well, I get it out of the Bible. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Now, when I was a young man, I was told growing up that I could go to any college I could get into. And I had whatever, I was two points off the highest score on the ACT. And they told me I could go to any school I wanted in America that accepted the ACT. SAT, I did okay. But on the ACT, I aced it. But I just went where Sue went, you know, so that was an easy choice. So Sue is going to Miami University. I went to Miami University. But that first year at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, God called me into the ministry. And so I went home and told my dad, took him to lunch. I could take you to the corner where the restaurant used to stand. And I took him to lunch, and I said, I'm not going back to Miami University. I'm going to Central Bible College. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be this or that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into the ministry. God's called me into the ministry. And sitting there that day at lunch, he cut me off. And he was true to his word. He was true to his word. That's why when I got to Springfield, I had to get a job. Well, you couldn't get a job. There were so many schools and universities in the one town, so I got a job selling cookware, and I learned more about the ministry actually doing outside sales than I did in Bible school. I am convinced God sent me to Springfield, Missouri not to go to Bible school, but to sell cookware because I learned everything about the ministry that was not natural to me. I learned how to talk to people. I learned how to, I learned how to handle rejection. I get fired every week. So it's a good thing I learned how to handle rejection. And I learned, I learned how to uh, talk to strangers. I, I learned how to uh, present my case. I learned all of this in those days. The point is that I paid my own way. But here's what happened. When my father cut me off, he lost his voice in my life. Now, you might think that's cruel or that's harsh. That's reality. You know, I'm just a young man coming up. You tell me you're going to pay for my college education, and then you cut me off, and now I got to pay. And I did, I did, I did. 
I paid the tuition, I paid the books, I paid the room and board, and then their food was no good, so I had to go uh, every night. Sue and I would go eat out after they served their slop in the cafeteria. And so, and I did it. I did it. But now you want to come along and tell me what to do? No way. It ain't going to happen. See, so he lost his voice in my life. And I saw that and I determined early on that I was not going to have that kind of relationship with my children. And so what we're really talking about is a balancing act. Because probably everybody in the room knows somebody whose parents spoiled them by handing them everything. Sue and I met a young gal making coffee at a place in Telluride, Colorado years ago. She had an MD. And she was a ski bum. So off season, she was a barista in the coffee shop. She lived to ski. So think about all the money that went into her bachelor's degree, went into the MD degree, went into all of that, and she wasn't even using it because she had a trust. So it's a balancing act to be a blessing but not spoil. And uh, so, for example, my kids, the one of the, you know, I kept trying to think of ways to do this. And so, for example, uh, when I, I blessed them with an automobile, uh, I bought the insurance. I don't want to leave that to risk. I don't, I don't want to leave that to risk. So I, I gave them a car. I bought the insurance. I handed them the keys, and I explained to them, this car is full of gas. And as long as I live, I will not refill it. So Austin, you know, with his keys, well, what am I supposed to do? You go to work. I mean, not one time, not one time, not one time. Now, Sue might have, but not one time. I never gave Austin money for a date. I told him, what difference does it make to me whether or not you have a date? <laughs> so in other words, I tried to balance. In other words, to be a blessing, but not to spoil. And this can be tough because it, we can go too far one way or we can go too far the other. All right. So in my opinion, my father was selfish, but I, don't want, I never wanted my own children to think of me in that way. Look at Ezra 9.12. Ezra 9.12. Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time that... You may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. I haven't said it so much in recent years, but back up in I-30, I would often say that if you don't do a good job raising your children, you will end up raising your grandchildren. And this is huge because children don't know everything, but they think they do. How many, of you, how many of you have experienced that? They, they, they don't know everything, but they think they do. See, the difference is, I don't know everything, but I know I don't. Teenagers don't know everything, but they think they do. That's the difference. So they have to be guided. And I don't know the name, but there's the part of the brain, you may remember, that evaluates risk. It's the center of judgment in a human brain. And that part of the human brain is not even fully developed until the mid-20s. And this is why young people do the dumbest things. I remember watching a video once that Austin had shown me or sent me a link to. These young people in Daytona Beach or somewhere, spring break, they had the idea to go up onto the roof of the hotel and jump three or four or five stories down into the pool. Well, first kid made it, second kid made it, along about number three or four. Well, he didn't make it. Well, see, I'm 59. I'm not going to jump off a three or story building to see if I can hit a pool. But see, that part of the brain that evaluates risk is not even fully developed until 25. So this is cruel, really especially in our culture. Because people are called upon to make the biggest decisions of their lives when they're not even ready. Are you going to have sex or not? 
Are you going to do drugs or not? See, they're called upon to make the biggest decisions of their lives, and they're not even, they're really not even mentally capable because that part of their, their brain that evaluates risk, the seat of judgment, is not even fully developed. Well, see, this is what parents are for, to give guidance. But let me tell you something about kids. And I, I, I've had little kids, and I've had teenage kids, and I've had college kids, and now i got grown kids. I think I know something about kids. You're going to have a really tough sell trying to have a voice in their life with no investment. I guess it's the same thing as Faith Christian Center, because if somebody has an investment and they have a suggestion, I pay more attention to that than if somebody has no investment and they have a suggestion, right? I mean, it, 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 the same is true with you. If you, if, you feel, if you go to work and you feel like that your boss is just and fair and has been generous with you, you're just a whole lot more likely to pay attention than if you feel like that they have used you and abused you and taken advantage of you. Am I right? All right, so we have, to, we have to walk through this with our children. And then notice, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. So this is where we have to guide them because they think they know everything, but they don't. So what we accumulate in this life should be preserved for future generations. And that means teaching your children to handle their money properly and training them that they also have a duty to preserve their, their wealth for their children. And so... We're past this point now, but I remember one of our early wills, uh, if something had happened to us, the kids would have gotten half the money, I think, uh, upon graduation from college. And uh, in other words, all education paid for. After that, half the money at graduation from college. In other words, an incentive to, to finish school. But then they would have gotten the rest at age 30. And the idea was that if they made dumb decisions, if they messed up, if they blew it, they would have a second chance. So we've tried to think some things through. And uh, you may be here tonight and think that everything we gather up ought to go to the government. I am not of that opinion. I am of the opinion that uh, they have taxed me my entire life. And so whatever I can, whatever vehicle I can use that is legal, I should use whatever vehicle is at my disposal to get as much as I possibly can to future generations. The way Sue and I did that is through insurance trusts. In other words, we literally many, many years ago bought insurance just to pay taxes so that what we have would go on to our children. But then that's not job done. I've got to train my son. I've got to train my daughter-in-law. I've got to train my daughter. I've got to train my son-in-law on what I expect. And I have a right to have expectations because I have an investment. Amen. And so that, okay, I'm a blessing to you with this, but then I expect you to be a blessing to your children, but not spoil them. And I expect you to be a blessing to your grandchildren, but not spoil them. Am I helping anybody tonight? Yes. So there's a balance to this deal. Now, we're talking about money. We're talking about wealth. We're talking about prosperity. If you want your family to be prosperous over time, see, what, it, what is Ezra saying back here? He's saying, don't give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. This is just huge. But there's nothing I have been more ignored on in 32 years. And you're going to ignore me right now. But I am going to unburden my heart and I'm going to do my duty. But there's nobody here tonight with a registered dog who doesn't know what other dog that dog's been lying with. Because you got a registered dog, that's a big deal. So you keep track. But we, we don't know what our children are doing. I'm saying we. I didn't say you. I didn't name your name. 
See, we live in a country, we live in a culture where people are more careful with their animals than they are with their children. And you're looking at a dangerous man. I mean, I'm a pastor, so people make assumptions. Don't make the wrong assumptions. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not typical. And so my, my grandchildren, I would protect them with violence in a moment, in a moment, without remorse or regret. They're, they don't belong to the government. They don't belong to the village. And they're not going to have the values and morals of the village. And I'm not going to permit, not if anybody wants any moolah, I'm not going to permit my, my grandchildren to be married off to the world. Amen. See, part of the reason I'm so blessed, part of the reason <laughs> how, how can I have all this overhead? Six, seven million a year and I got peace. Shivani, when, when was the last time you saw me nervous? I mean, how can I do that? How can I have all this overhead and have peace? Well, see, I, I did that deferred gratification thing. And I invested and I taught and I invested and I taught and I invested and I taught. So my daughter-in-law, see, uh, my son was equally yoked to my daughter-in-law and she's a tither. My daughter was equally yoked to her husband and he was a tither. Now, I didn't talk them into it. They were tithers before they met. In other words, we're, 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 we're given guidance here because we want a desired result. So what I don't want to happen is my grandpa, I never met him. He, he died when my dad was eight years old. On my dad's side, he was full gospel. He was Pentecostal. But his, his oldest boy went to hell. His youngest boy went to hell. His wife went to hell. I mean, what would that be like to be in heaven and years go by, years go by, years go by and your spouse not show up and your son not show up and your daughter not show up and what would that be like? Man, you would be heartbroken in heaven. Well, let me tell you what, by God, I didn't, I didn't tithe all these years and live for God all these years and do all this that I've done all these years to lose my family. And I'm not against animals, but you know, an animal's an animal. But a son, a daughter, a grandson, a granddaughter, this is my family. This is what's important. So I'm not leaving this to chance. I'm just not leaving it to chance. And let me tell you something else about success and prosperity. When you have success and when you are a success and when you have money, you have choices. Amen. Amen. See, it, let's say you have to go to some other town because somebody passed away or there's a funeral or whatever. See, if you don't have no money, you have no choice. You got to stay at the Hampton Inn or whatever. But when you have money, you have a choice. You could stay at the Hilton or you could stay wherever you want. I mean, money gives you choices. And even on this thing of protecting children. And I don't know what people think, but I mean, if we, if we had to sell cars, I mean, if we had to sell watches, whatever we had to sell, I'm talking about me. Our children would not attend public school because I don't want them watching porn. Now, that's just me. See how excited they all are? <laughs> yeah, that's it, man. Right on. That's just me. Because, I, I mean, now, I'm a product of public school. But I'm a product of public school in the 60s. And they didn't teach us any Bible. People act like, you know, well, they, they we had to get the Bible out of the school. There, I, I never heard a verse or saw a Bible cracked when I was in public school. But the morality of the Judeo-Christian tradition underlied all of it. In other words, murder was wrong, lying was wrong, 
Stealing was wrong. In other words, the morality was there, but it wasn't Bible. It was the Judeo-Christian tradition, which, by the way, is what made this country the richest, greatest, most powerful nation that history has ever seen. But we weren't taught Bible. I mean, never one time, never one time. We got to get rid of the Ten Commandments. I went 12 years through public school, and nobody ever referred to the Ten Commandments. This what they do is they create straw men to tear down. It's sophistry. They just, uh, their arguments are false. The Bible is never in the public schools. Am I helping anybody? And so, but when I came up through public school, we did, there was no, there was no sex ed. There was no porn, not, not even heterosexual porn. I mean, there was no porn, but now you got heterosexual porn, you got homosexual porn, and I don't want my children, I, don't, I, don't want, I didn't want my children exposed to it. I don't want my grandchildren exposed to it. And that's just how strong I am. If you're here tonight and maybe you don't have that ability, well, that's why we try and develop scholarship money at St. Paul's Preparatory Academy. And that's why this church has to get richer, which is why I'm on this on a Wednesday night. Tell your neighbor, tell your neighbor, pastor needs for you to make some serious money. Because let's say somebody walked in, let's say you're here tonight, you wrote a check for a million bucks. I have no trouble. I would do it in a heartbeat. My uh, uh, chief financial officer's here, she, so she's hearing me say it. I would have no trouble if you designated, okay, here's a million bucks to create uh, additional scholarship money for St. Paul's Preparatory Academy. I would do it. Because every year we hear heartbreaking stories of church members and they don't have that ability. And that's ridiculous. We ought to have that, Amen. right? Amen. We ought to have that. Amen. To where anybody that's a member here could have their children at St. Paul's, whether they, whether they can, quote, afford it or not. But what I'm saying is for me, and, and I think people misread things. People misread things. So my son and daughter-in-law over here, they pay tuition at St. Paul's. See, that's part of that not spoiling people. The only thing I know of free that goes on here is when I'm in the cafe, they do not charge me because none of this would be here without me. That's the, that's the only thing I know of in this entire church that happens with, with uh, freebie. Other than that, my son pays. He want coffee, you pay. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Because at the end of the day, what we're talking about is character. Because people don't respect something for nothing. Amen. All right. So let's see if I can get to a breaking point because I'm out of, town, out of time and we have to receive an offering. Number four, our part, a part of our job as parents is to invest in and prepare the next generation. This is huge. There's a man here tonight when his house was under construction. He wrote these verses on the two by four of framing all over the interior of the house before they sheetrocked it. Deuteronomy 11, verse 18, fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. I remember years ago, my daughter rehearsed to me one of the talks I had to her with her about getting pregnant uh, before marriage and I was like shocked she rehearsed it back to me and, and I, I'm a minister and I was shocked Whew. and I said to her did I really say all that oh yeah when Austin was just a little guy I would put him in a car and I would take him to a certain street in Fort Worth and I would show him women you, you see that you see why she's dressed like that you know why she's dressed like that and I would tell him he was, he was just 8, 9, 10, 11 I'd tell him you lay down with that and you're going to have body parts fall off <laughs> I took both of my children and I showed them the men that live under the bridge uh, on I th uh, under the bridge, uh, bridge embankments on I-30 down near downtown Fort Worth. Whenever uh, it was summertime in August and these old white-headed guys were shoveling asphalt, doing road repairs, I would, I would say, 
Now, I'm not rolling down the window and say, hey, dude, you should have stayed in school. No, I'm not being cruel, but I'm saying to my own children, they're my children, I can say whatever I want. I said to my own children, why would a white-headed man shovel asphalt in Texas in August if he had a choice? See, that's what I'm talking about tonight. And I hope to God you're listening to me because I'm telling you success gives you choices and money gives you choices. You don't have to stand in no government cheese line if you have money. You don't have to take what they're handing out if you have money. You know, they hand you a, a, a Section 8 voucher. Well, guess what? There's certain places where you can live. But I'm telling you, honey, you got success going your way and you got some money. You can live wherever you doggone please. Amen. You That's pick right. where you want to live. That's right. That's right. When was the last time you, you think I was ever on a city bus? No, I was. When I, when I sold uh, jewelry downtown Fort Worth at Edison's, I rode the city bus. But that's been, that's been many a moon. I remember one day. Now, I'm going to say this right here to offend the devil. So tell your neighbor, brace yourself. Brace yourself. When Austin and I are in London, we love the subways because we can move fast. But I remember the day uh, I'm, I'm in a subway in London with Pastor Sue, and her mink coat gets caught in the door. And she turned at me, and she said to me, I'm not ever riding one of these subways again. So she said, you just get your mind around it. I'm not ever getting on a subway again. Okay. <laughs> and the reason I like the subways is they're fast. So when Sue's with me, I got to stay above ground. I got to ride the taxis. It takes forever, whatever. But Austin and I, man, we get on those tubes, man, we're gone. <laughs> but I'm saying money gives you choices. Right. Teach them to your children talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. That's what I did. Austin said in a sermon here a while back, you think the word is strong here. You should have heard it at my house. And you know what part of my job is, frankly, as a dad? To warn them and 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 warn them. When I was a kid... The worst thing we faced was some marijuana dealers in high school. Although I did get attacked one night by some, some hoodlums. The two guys I with were stoned. They were of no help whatsoever. But uh, in other words, that being aside, maybe fighting. But the worst thing we were up against when I was in high school was some Mary Jane dealers. That's it. But oh my God. With these kids today, I don't judge them. My heart goes out to them. What they're up against today. I mean, you have, forget about the, the heroin and the crack and the cocaine, but now you got all these designer drugs, and now you got this uh, hillbillies all over here uh, cooking meth in their bathtubs. I mean, it's unbelievable. And not just that. When I was a kid in high school, there really weren't sexual predators. But today, you got sexual predators. And I'm not just talking about men. I had a young man tell me out here, he's, uh, he's a, a sophomore in college now, but I had a young man tell me out here, actually it wasn't him, it was his dad, that uh, he went to school and he was propositioned on a regular basis by girls. You don't have to like me. You don't have to take me out. You don't have to date me. Uh, uh, you know, just let me service you and uh, you, you can uh, like me. You don't even have to date me. I mean, what kind of self-esteem level are we dealing with this in this culture out here? Predators. Male, female, predators. And so part of my job is, and I know you come to church, and probably there are people here, and you think, well, I wish he'd get more positive. Part of my job is to warn you and warn you and warn you and warn you. I've been warning you about debt. And to warn you. That Satan has come. He has not come to party with you. This is the lie. The lie. And this is what he tells young people. You know, let's party. Satan has not come to party. He has come to steal. He has come to destroy. He has come to, to kill. This is his business. And so our job is to warn them and warn them and warn them. 
and, and to guide them because they're not even prepared mentally. They're not even prepared emotionally. They're not even prepared spiritually to, to make the biggest decisions of their lives between maybe 12 and 22. They're not even prepared. And this is, this is our job. I could, sit, I could stand here until midnight. If I had not lost all the young people I lost, you would be sitting in one of the biggest mega churches in the Metroplex tonight. I could stand here until midnight and tell story after story. I'm thinking of two girls. Uh, they were sisters. They, they both said they were called into the ministry. Their goal in life was to go down here to Waxahachie to the Assemblies of God uh, College and, and be trained for the ministry. Uh, they turned 16. They were, they were St. Paul students. They turned 16. Their, their father sent them to Whataburger, sent them both to Whataburger to get a job. Within months, within months, within months, they were both uh, pregnant. And because being Christian people, you know, they had the babies, but then you're off the market. It's tough to finish high school with a baby. And then, and then you're off the market. Now listen, I know that what I'm saying can be perceived to be impolite. But I don't care whether we're talking about oil, natural gas, stocks, bonds, automobiles, or people. We are all subject to market forces. And you don't even know what I'm talking about, maybe. But I, I mean, you, you go to any high-end store in London or Paris, and the place is just chock full of beautiful women. I mean, beautiful young women. And nobody has a ring. Nobody has a ring. Nobody has a ring. Nobody has a ring. Because it's market forces. There are so many guys of the alternate persuasion. There is just not a supply of men. I'm talking about supply and demand, baby. And then in our culture, it's not that bad, but you have this whole, you have millions upon millions upon millions, and, and they got no job. They got no potential. And, and their whole objective in life is to sleep with as many women as possible. So that takes millions out of the equation. And so if a girl starts down the wrong road, she hurts herself. She hurts her chances. Somebody said, right now, somebody's thinking, oh, I don't believe that. Well, that's what I told you. I've been ignored on this 32 years. So, you know, you just ignore away. You just ignore away. But I go home, and when I turn the security off and I walk through the door, you know what's there waiting on me? the presence of God and the peace of God. Amen. And I go over to my son's house, and you know what's over there? The peace of God. I go to my, my, my son-in-law's house, and you know what's there? The peace of God. Man, I got the peace of God because I was not careless. I was careful. So who would be against success and prosperity? Because, see, success and prosperity gives me choices. I'm thinking of another young girl, really pretty, tall, thin, really pretty. She turned 16. Her father made her get a job at Walmart, and the only position was a second shift, and her father made her walk. And I don't know when Walmart closes. Uh... But whenever it closes, I mean, she had to walk home. And bitter, bitter, bitter. She actually uh, worked for a company that sold our cafe some supplies. I was in there. This was a few years ago. I saw her. I said, hey, how you doing? And, uh, you know, pleasant. And she did, she did marry. But she was bitter, man. Bitter, 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 bitter. Bitter against her parents. See, and the problem is, because of the way they did her while they were pretending to be such great big Christians... She was bitter against the church. She was not this church, but the church. She was bitter. She was bitter against God. She was bitter against Christianity because of the way her parents did her. And I could stand here and tell story after story after story after story. I remember one girl. She was, she was pretty. 
turned 18, graduated from high school. I can't make this up. I couldn't make it up. Her, her mother and her stepfather told her to pack her stuff. And they took her to an apartment. I mean, no, no job, no car, took her to an apartment and said, your first month's rent is paid. God bless. And left her in an empty apartment with her suitcases. And of course, what do you think happened? Well, she just took up with the first guy that she came across. And you can sit here and look at me in that tone of voice all you want to, but I am not afraid of you. I don't work for you. I am just trying to help you. Now, I know, I know, I know we'll probably get some, you know, negative feedback and whatever, but I'm, I'm just trying to help you. See, all I want for you is God's best. Amen. Amen. And all I want for your children is God's best. I want to see them, man, I want to see them grow up strong and true. I want to, and you know what? I want to see them marry well. I want to see them find somebody worthy of them. And you know what? I want to see them happy. But we're not going to get there being careless. And this, this is not something I'm making up, man. I mean, I'm telling you, man, it's right here in the Bible. Teach them. What are we talking about? Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children. Talking, this generation, your children know more about Kim Kardashian's backside than they do the word of God. You know, how big is it this week? They know all about that. But they don't know the Bible. And the Bible is not the church's responsibility and it's not my responsibility. You're the parents. It's your responsibility. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit here. We're at number five. But let me tell you something. When my kids hit high school, I started seeing decisions I did not like. I, I mean, I was alarmed. And I knew better than to rant and rave and scream and fuss. I mean, I knew that, you know, you walk this fine line with teenagers because if you get too overbearing, you lose your voice. And so here's what I did, and we're going to deal with this Sunday. Here's what I did. I just took it to the Lord. And this was over weeks. I mean, I was alarmed, but I didn't just rant and rave and carry on. I took it to the Lord, and I had an idea. And the idea I had was this, and you might not be able to do this where you are, but this is where I was, and this is what I did. I sat them both down because kids need money, and kids always need more money. I sat them both down, and I didn't say, I'm alarmed at your decisions. I told them that later. But here's what I did. I said, I know you all need more money. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> so I said, here's what we're going to do. I said, I, and I gave them a reading list, 20, 30 books. And it was books that had shaped my life. I mean, I started them off easy, 1984, Brave New World, Fahrenheit 451, Animal Farm. And then we got more serious. I got into Don Fetter, uh, Slouching Towards Sodom. I got into uh, Harry Blamere's The Christian Mind. Uh, I think the first two that I gave them were Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, and W. Clement Stone, The Success System That Never Fails. And so that's what I did. I gave them a list, and the list grew over time as I thought of more books. I gave them a list of 20 or 30 books to start, and then I said, every time you read one of these books, I'll give you 100 bucks. And within weeks, the bad decision stopped. <laughs> Without me ranting, raving, screaming, carrying on and even as smart as Austin is you know he wasn't reading a book a day or something he was maybe reading a book every week or two and then when they hit college because of the demands of college then of course that slowed down so it's, they didn't bankrupt me or something but instantly the decisions began to change instantly 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 based on a reading well why didn't you have him read the bible Well, I, I didn't want my, my children to think that I was like a crazy Bible thumper. I wanted them to think that I was well-read. 
and I, I, I came up with the wisdom of life that I had from a variety of sources. And from my perspective, they should have been reading the Bible anyway. And they were reading the Bible. We knew that because we would read to them before they went to bed, and then Sue was on to that. Am I helping anybody tonight? Yes. Children have to be loved. They have to be guided. They have to be warned. The hardest part of the ministry, you know what the hardest part of the ministry is? It's not having faith and buying land and drawing buildings and building buildings. That's not hard. Anybody with faith can do that. You know what the hardest part of the ministry is? Watching people make decisions. It's like watching train wrecks in slow motion. That's the hardest part of the ministry. Because I see it. You do this, this is going to be the result. You do that, this is going to be the result. It's, it's tough. And that's why, because I'm not talking to kids tonight. I'm talking to y'all. Amen. See? And so then you go home, and now don't go home and read them the right act, and you can't fix bad parenting in a week. So you're going to have to ease into it, just be a little more involved. No child... In my opinion, no child that comes to this church on Sunday should go to bed at night without a parent praying with them. That's my opinion. I don't have Bible on it. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I never played the big man. I got on my knees next to their bed, and I prayed with my children. Now, I didn't do that every night. Sometimes Sue did. But what I'm saying is no child that is in this church on Sunday should go to sleep at night without being prayed with. Mm -hmm. And then what we would do, because we're talking about the peace of God, you know, kids have dreams and monsters in the closet and all of that. We would read to them, and then as they got older, then they read to us, and then we would pray with them, and then they would have the peace of God on them. Amen. You want a preview of Father's Day Guys Night Out? Letters from the future. The thought never occurred to me. That I would live more years in an empty house than a house with children. It never occurred to me. And then one day, and that's why you got to love your wife. Because when those children are gone, that's all you're going to have, brother. <laughs> I mean, one day I look up, and it's just Sue. Well, you got to get along with her. Because guess what? You're going to have more years without those children than you have with. And so don't complain. Love them. Hug them. Pray for them. When they're driving you stark, raving mad, <laughs> love them, hug them, pray for them, because it's a season and it will pass. Amen. 